So my name is Morgan. I am on staff here with Storehouse. And so, yeah, we are currently walking through what true intimacy is and how God designed it and what it fully looks like to walk in it in the way that he has intended. And so we spent significant time looking at our relationship with the Lord at the beginning of this series. And last week we started stepping into intimacy with others. And so we're going to continue to spend time on that today. And so at Storehouse, we are defining intimacy as, right? I had it upside down. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't matter if I'm pressing the down arrow. <laughs> so at Storehouse, we are defining intimacy as giving access to the inmost parts of who you are. And so we as a culture, even if we don't intend to, we look at people economically. We ask the question, am I getting enough out of this relationship? And this is how we remain in friendship with those, um, really, to some degree. But when we do this, we are automatically losing intimacy. And even if we realize it or not, we are assessing those around us. We are, ask ourselves the question, are they worth connecting with? But what is actually breaking that connection? It's an assessment where we are using ourselves as the standard. Last week, Curtis talked about how assessing others as better than ourselves can break that connection. He chatted about a false humility that we can create where we lower ourselves so much to the point that we are devaluing ourselves, causing us to feel like a burden to others or even incompetent. While this is something we can definitely relate to, we can often swing too far in the other direction as well. Today we are focusing on how we can assess others as worse, less than ourselves, and how that breaks connection. Our tendency can allow us to be protective over ourselves so that we pull away. And this is either from a lack of understanding someone else, their choices, their decisions, really just having differing views than us or because we've been hurt by someone and now we have deemed them unworthy. And even though those may seem like two different things, they both deal with a desire to protect ourselves. And at the root of either of those assessments is pride. The question we are considering today is what if the grass is actually greener? What if the world's presence was actually a blessing to you? What if the world's presence was actually a blessing to you. We need to live into what we were designed for. As we talked about in the first few weeks, God, he gives us an identity and he gives us a purpose. And people, they are a part of that purpose. As Curtis shared last week, and Elena will share next week. We are on the same mission as Jesus was on, and he worked with others. So when we look at the assessments that we make, where we are making ourselves as the standard, we see pride is in the heart of it all. And I believe pride, it can be really hard um, for us to recognize because I don't think we are quick to identify it. Um, they, we don't realize that what we are acting in or what we are thinking of as prideful behavior. It's often disguised as protection over ourselves because of the difference of others or the way that they have hurt us. But ultimately we are still being self-focused. So pride can be summarized as an attitude of self-sufficiency, self-importance, and self-exaltation in relation to God. But towards others, it is an attitude of contempt and indifference. So simply, it is an elevation of self. And so I think there are moments that we are quick to point it out um, as we are witnessing them in the world. You know, we see people gloating when they are super successful. We see people pompously walking around when they have a lot of power. And I think those are more clear instances where we see it in the world. But the reality is pride comes down to really just different elements of self-centeredness that really just manifest multiple ways in our lives, especially in regards to others. So it can look like being hypersensitive, um, resentful. It can look like defensiveness. This is really stemming from those moments where we have been hurt by people. With this, we see a protection over our hearts. Sometimes it can look like us being judgmental or maybe overcritical. And this is stemming from a desire to show that we are worthy of praise in comparison to others. With this, we see a protection over our image. 
And so as we see, it can be easier to get caught up in pride than we may have originally thought. Um, it sneaks up on us because we often believe, you know, that our intentions are good, especially in those situations where we've been hurt by those that we love and care about. So when did we first assess that people weren't safe? Uh, when was it that we first responded in protecting ourselves? And so when we see that pride, it ultimately leads us to make these assessments about the people around us. There is a desire for control in who gets access to our hearts, who gets to see the inmost parts of ourselves. And so we are protecting ourselves from people when they have hurt us. And I do want to make a disclaimer that obviously healthy boundaries are essential. Um, you know, those can be good when we have repeatedly been hurt or manipulated by somebody. Um, so what I'm talking about today would not be the case for that. We are a storehouse firm believers in boundaries. Uh, we can't continuously allow the same people to hurt us. Um, but what we want to look at today is, you know, the reality of our culture is we are really quick to label people as toxic. Um, and really that's under the guise of self-care for ourselves. Um, and in reality, what we are doing is we are glorifying breaking connection. And so I want to challenge us um, today and what it looks like to enter into a good thing, not laying ourselves up for more hurt. Because we realize when we make these decisions with the desire for control and protection, the people we care about now and ourselves, um, we will suffer. And so when we drop pride and we experience true intimacy, giving access to the inmost parts of who we are, two things are really evidence of that. And I think we see that in forgiveness and in reconciliation. Let's see, story time. That's Erin. She is my longest friend that I've ever had. And so we became besties back in sixth grade. I can find, I'm gonna go find an old picture, but they're all at like my parents' house. And so before digital stuff, you know, so hard. <laughs> but yeah, we became besties back in sixth grade. So we've shared, you know, countless sleepovers and crushes and choreographed, you know, dances. <laughs> and as you can see in the center that we are 99.9% .9 sure that we are Disney princesses. So, you know, foundational for our relationship. Um, but yeah, so we went to the same middle school, um, but we ended up going to different high schools, different colleges, ended up in really different cities, and now we're in <laughs> different states. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have remained close friends, um, but this hasn't, you know, been without work. Uh, and so when, yeah, back in those trans transition transitionary years of, like, college, um, that freshman year was just really hard for us. Um, I felt like any time that I would reach out or try to connect with her, she kind of like ghosted me. Um, yeah, there were times that like I wouldn't get any response at all. So it felt like she was avoiding me uh, and yeah, just really wasn't engaging with me. So there was just like unresolved conflict that like weighed very heavy on really me. And so honestly, yeah, that was just super hurtful. Um, yeah, I didn't understand how she could just shut me out and like ignore our whole foundational, you know, six years of friendship before that. <laughs> and that was just really hard for me. And I, I recognize that we were at different places for the first time in our lives, but that didn't warrant you know, any lack of communication. And so I didn't really understand. Um, I wanted to quit. I kind of wanted to tap out. I wanted to protect myself um, because it didn't make sense what she was doing. And you know, I didn't want to continue to reach out and waste my time. And so because I determined, you know, I, I'm hurt. I, you know, she is not worthy of me putting myself out there. Um, and so as I was approaching, you know, heading home for the summer, I realized, oof, I'm going to see her. So like, I probably, we should probably have a conversation before it's like super awkward. And so I was like, I'll reach out to her. You know, I'd let this go on for too long at this point. It had been like the full year of like my freshman year. And so, yeah, I sent her a text, asked if we could chat on the phone. And so we talked, you know, I, I affirmed her and the friendship that we had developed, you know, I talked about how I missed her and I acknowledged the growing tension and distance that was sort of coming um, over that past year. And so I asked her if there was anything wrong or something that I would have done to have like caused that, laid it really kind of all out on the table. And yeah, so she was like super silent for a while and then like broke down um, and she had shared that. So like earlier that year, her and her longtime boyfriend had broken up. And so for her, it was really hard to interact with people who were in like, 
I guess, relationships that seem to be flourishing. So for her to witness that and to interact with people, that was really hard on her. And so with that, she had pulled away from most of her friends and then therefore including me. So I was like, oh yes, that makes sense. <laughs> but I had allowed something to go unsettled and unhealed um, in the both of us because of an offense to my pride. Um, yes, I had felt hurt and devalued, um, but because we are human in our relationships, that is inevitable, like that'll happen and pop up you know, sometimes. But my reaction was the fruit of a wounded pride. And so Proverbs 13, 10, it tells us, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. So my wounded pride had left me in the dark. I was blind to it because I hadn't dealt with it. And so whenever we have allowed pride to take control, you know, it is as though blinders, they are put on us and, and we cannot see anyone else's pain because we are just far too consumed by our own. And the crazy thing through it all was not only, you know, I'd see myself as the victim and Erin as prideful, but I didn't even recognize that my behavior and my actions were also prideful. Um, I, before I realized, you know, I had deemed her less valuable because of the way that she was responding to me. I wasn't willing to engage in a conversation, so I made that assessment and I was like, nope, I'm not going to join into that. And so intimacy was broken. But we see that true intimacy is seeking reconciliation rather than, you know, sitting on this throne of righteousness. Um, it was about letting go of all my pride, you know, these thoughts I had that like, you're the problem, I'm hurt, you know, it's all about me. I've done no wrong here and really just moving in um, and leaning into just humility, grace and forgiveness, switching to those thoughts of, you know, do I have a responsibility or role in this as a friend? I'm not perfect either. You know, how can we resolve this and come together? And so one of the best ways to combat pride is to look at how we encounter forgiveness um, and interact with it. And so forgiveness, it requires us to lay down what might be rightfully ours, so like our hurts, our grievances, just our desire for revenge, <laughs> um, in exchange for something greater, so healing, peace, that reconciliation. Pride gets in the way of making that important exchange because it completely blinds us to our faults and to our weaknesses. And in the heat of an argument or in the face of that offense, it's easy to focus on the faults of the other person and even magnify them and totally overlook our own. And if we're not careful, we see what we want to see rather than what's really there. And Jesus says, he warns us about this in Matthew 7. He says we're quick to look at the speck in another's eye while ignoring the gigantic plank in our own. And so we cannot let pride get in the way of experiencing this true intimacy with one another. But here Aaron and I were now, you know, giving access to the inmost parts of who we are. Um, we were just this raw vulnerability made a way for us to enter into open conversation and just to have, you know, these honest words with one another. But first, I had to relinquish control by offering up that forgiveness and seeking that reconciliation. And so as you can imagine, you know, that's very exposing and a very vulnerable place to be. But forgiveness is this attitude to the heart that says, I need to be willing to let go um, of whatever it is that I am holding against you and my heart towards you. Um, you know, I am willing to release you from the debt that you have incurred by what you have done to me. And I believe that is a perfect and beautiful picture of the gospel, which I also believe answers that question. You know, what if the world's presence was actually a blessing to you? And by seeking reconciliation with Aaron, you know, our friendship continued uh, to this day, you know, it's been such a blessing to me. Um, if I had let my pride continue to separate us, you know, I would have missed out on these past 16 years, which, oh my gosh, that's a really long time, 16 years, it's something to celebrate. You know, she has always been the one who really understood me and helped me through a lot of difficult times and moments. She was standing by me on my wedding day. Um, it really has just been a gift and light to my life. But because we are human, the reality is when there is a presence of people in our lives, there will be moments of hurt. And that, that is just the reality. But it does not have to have the last word in those relationships. When we make these assessments which deem others unworthy, this can negatively reflect the gospel. But with this forgiveness and reconciliation, we see how the world gets a chance to play um, as a blessing in our own, in our own world. It's an opportunity to allow us to shape what it is that we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. 
It leads us to a place where we get to come to the Lord, fully aware that we are owed nothing by him. And that's what allows us to go towards other people and seek reconciliation, to see their value and to see their worth. And I believe that a more accurate assessment question isn't, are they worth connecting with? But how can I hate that which Christ loves? Not turn. Okay, I'm trying to just move my head. <laughs> so this brings up, you know, the other way that we seek to protect ourselves, and that is when we encounter those who have differing views than us. And so the reality of stepping into intimacy and loving our neighbor and the people around us would be easy if they were all just like us, you know, that we would understand them, that we agreed with them, people just like you. But since we are human, we can so quickly be under the impression that our way is right and our way is good and everything that you believe has to be wrong. And we can take that a step further and be like, you know what, I am not even interacting with you. We get to this point where, um, yeah, there's just a lack of understanding. Um, and so we've assessed and said, you are lesser value. Um, we may not admit it outright, but that is what we are doing internally. And I believe this is extremely relevant, you know, in our culture today, where we are just so polarized in our views that we are so quick to no longer um, engage with one another. When someone has a different view that we can't possibly understand or even resonate with, we pull away and we put ourselves up on that pedestal and we are protecting our image. So how do we even begin to reconcile with those differences? And so we're going to read um, the parable of the tax collector. So if you have your Bibles, but it will also be on the screen. It's in Luke 18, and we are going to start reading in verse 9. To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people. And he lists robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And I think we can read this and say, like, well, phew, at least I'm not as bad as, like, that Pharisee. Like, he's super harsh. He's super mean. But the reality is, you know, we do these same things even if we do not explicitly say these words. Our views and our identity are things that we hold on to so tightly that we are prone to thinking this way, just like the Pharisee, and we end up protecting our image. Even the disciples amongst themselves, at one point, they argued, you know, who is the greatest of us? And so even though we may not outwardly see, say these things, our actions and the way we interact with one another, you know, that is a manifestation of how we truly are feeling. And I believe to combat this pride, we need to cultivate and grow really in our empathy with one another. And, you know, I believe that this is essential to build new relationships, um, forging new pathways, but also to nurture these relationships that we already have and the Lord has placed in our lives. Only then can we begin to let um, those have access to the inmost parts of us. And really, it's taking that step forward and starting as we enter into what those are offering themselves. And so if the basis of our assessment is ourselves, then we should give room to ourselves to contemplate, you know, what other people's decisions are and what their values are. I think it's important for us to take moments, um, put ourselves in their shoes, getting into the practice of examining our own hearts, reflecting and challenging, you know, what if, spending like time really like meditating on that. And so, yeah, I'm going to ask some questions, and these are just some things to think through, um, but sort of like, like, you know, entering into this moment of reflecting, if I was this person, you know, how would these things play out? And so, what if it was my parents who were sick, cold, and alone? How would love bring healing? What if I were struggling to pay rent and buy groceries? How would love show me God's generosity? What if my friend was caught in the cycle of addiction? How might love set me free? 
What if I lost my sibling to violence? How would love grieve with me? And so empathy, that will slowly start to develop when we're able to just really put ourselves aside um, and picture ourselves in someone else's story um, or someone else's situation. Um, we come back to that question, yeah, what if the world's presence was actually a blessing to you? And I think this is part of the reason that Jesus often told um, his stories and parables um, so that we could witness the life of someone else, see it in a new way through the eyes of another. And when those complained about Jesus eating with tax collectors and other people that, you know, they deemed undesirable, he didn't say, hey, they have value too. But he told the story um, of the lost one and how God, um, or sorry, he told the story about the lost sheep and the shepherd who left the 99 to get to the one. Or as we read earlier, when Jesus, he saw the proud give such harsh judgment, he told the story of the humble tax collector. But we can't just stop there. You know, we have to take it a step further. We, what does it actually look like to engage in conversation with someone who is drastically different or has these differing views? And when we begin to have these conversations with people, we'll realize how all of our experience have shaped who we are and, and why we believe what we do. And that is a really beautiful thing. And that doesn't mean that everyone, you know, is equally right in all of the things that they are always sharing, but we are equally valuable. And if we look at value first, only then are we able to enter into that conversation. So how do we do that? In order to have a right view with others, we have to have a right view of ourselves. And so sure, we may be different from one another, but certain things are common to us all. We are all God's creation, right? We are made in his image. We are dependent on him. Uh, we are human. And, but once we come to know him, we are also all of his children. We are created we are loved, redeemed, and gifted by him with unique gifts and talents and experiences. And once we allow this to sink in and ask the Lord, you know, how to shift how we view ourselves, only then are we able to shift how we view others. And when we enter into this right relationship with one another, regardless of all of our differences and differing views, we will see a more accurate picture of the kingdom of God and how he has designed us all for community. So we value discussion here at Storehouse. So we are going to break up into smaller groups um, in a moment, and we are going to talk through these two questions together. Cool. So how do you see pride disguised as protection in your own life? How do you resonate with protecting your heart or your image? And then if you guys have time, reflect and share about a time where you misjudged someone and it hindered your relationship.